Hello, I'm Mr. Lineweber, and this is Lesson 6.3, Mechanical Energy for Science 10. We're going to be using the definition of energy as the ability to do work, and we're going to discuss two main types of energy, kinetic and potential. To begin, in our discussion of kinetic energy, we're going to discuss it as the energy of motion. Energy of motion depends on speed and mass of an object and is given by this formula here, one-half mv squared, where the kinetic energy is measured in joules, the same unit that we used for work. m is in the standard unit of kilograms, and speed v here is in the standard unit of meter per second. And we're going to be using speed because energy is a scalar, not a vector. Here's the standard units for the joule. Now using the formula, EK equal to one-half mv squared, you always have to use speed units of meters per second. So if you are given kilometers per hour, just remember to divide by 3.6 to get it into meters per second. So one half multiplied by 1500 kilograms multiplied by 14 meters per second, all squared. So in the calculator, I'll just type 0 0.5 times 1,500 times 14 to the power 2. And I got 147,000 kilograms meter square per second square. And with the question only having two significant digits, This 7 will round the 4, we'll have 1.5 times 10 to the, let me count the decimal moves, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 decimal moves, and this is the joule. Alright, so other variations of this question, or this formula, is when you're given the energy and you're asked to solve for one of the parameters. So if EK energy kinetic is equal to one half mv squared and you're asked to solve for the mass then what the easiest thing to do is to times both sides by 2 times by 2 times by 2 so now we have 2 EK equals mv squared as this one half and this two will cancel. And now you can go ahead and solve for mass. If you want to solve for mass, you just simply divide out velocity squared. So there's an expression for mass. It's two times the kinetic energy divided by the speed squared. So that's one way to go. Or you can divide out the mass. So let's rewrite it. Again, 2ek equals mv squared. So now I'll divide out the mass. That cancels this. Now I have 2ek over m equals v squared. And now what I have to do to get rid of this is power 2 is square root that whole result. All right, and you should practice doing that on your own um, from scratch because remember you only get the original form on your data sheet. So here's two expressions, one that solves for mass and one that solves for velocity. Now the uh, reality is you don't have to do that that way either. What you can do is you can simply just plug in the values. So here we're plugging in the joules, plugging in the kilograms. And then you can just simply simplify these numbers and then divide out numbers and then you can see here at the end they're square rooting the result and you can do it that way as well.
So for this question, you can see it worked out here for you. Now the second form of energy is potential energy and there's various forms of potential energy like the potential energy in the chemical bonds you know, like for example when you eat food and your body uh, metabolizes that and you get kinetic energy out of it. Um, there's potential energy stored in the bonds of an elastic when you stretch it like for example in a bow and arrow. And the most common form of potential energy that's studied in Science 10 is gravitational potential energy. And so gravitational potential energy uh, relates uh, forces uh, of gravity and vertical distances, as you can see developed on the side here. So if we know that work is FD and that force is the force of gravity, which is mg, then we get this formula mgh, which we're going to call gravitational potential energy. And so often we write it as ep equals to mgh in our studies. On the side here, you can see that if you wanted to solve for h, you just divide out mg. If you wanted to solve for g, you divide out mh. If you'd wanted to solve for m, you would divide out gh. So gravitational potential energy depends on height, and so you always need uh, a relative position for that height. So we call this our reference point. And so, for example, lifting a book from a desk and then dropping it, you would have to use uh, the floor as the reference position, typically. So coming to look at this question here, we have uh, your shelf, and we have your desk, and we have your chair, and we have the floor. So it looks like because the floor is the zero centimeter, that's your reference, if there was no other mention of that. Uh, okay, so the shelf by your desk, 140 centimeters above the floor, we can convert that into meters by dividing by 100. That's necessary to get into the standard units. The mass of the book is 1.2 kilograms, so that's good. It's in the standard unit. And they're asking us to find EP, gravitational EP, relative to the floor, and then relative to the desk. So relative to the floor, your EP is simply just mgh, so 1.2 kilograms. The G value on Earth, remember, is 9.81 meters per second square. And then relative to the floor, the potential energy of the book on the shelf, so the book is on the shelf, relative to the floor, the height that we'd use is 1.4 meters. Multiplying those together, and I'll just sneak in the meters there. And we got 1.2 times 9.81 times 1.4. And it looks like two significant digits. So I'm going to be able to round this down to 16 joules. Have a look at the units. You can see it's the same as above. Kilograms, meters squared per second squared, which is the joule. Now the exact same question relative to the desk. So now the height difference is here. So 140 centimeters minus the height of the desk, which is 70 centimeters. This delta H is 70 centimeters. So relative to the desk, your potential energy, mgh, is going to be 1.2 kilograms 9.81 meters per second square, the gravitational acceleration due to gravity. And then here, we're going to put in 70 centimeters is 0 0.7 meters.
and this is going to come out to 8. Eight point two joules with two significant digits. And just to reflect on the question, if it's going, if the if the sh if the object has more potential to fall a larger distance, it has a higher potential energy. If it has less potential to fall due to smaller distance, it has less potential energy. So. Just to uh, add on to this video, this lesson, uh, 6.3b, is going to talk about uh, systems and the first and second laws of thermodynamics, as well as the formula for efficiency. And the formula for efficiency is taken up actually in the 6.4 lesson. So I will just talk about some of these concepts briefly as they only will play just a minor role in the Science 10 curriculum for physics. And so to establish some of these definitions, we'll begin with the definition of a system, which is just a set of interconnected parts, and everything else is considered the environment or the surroundings. So we usually have some collection of items that we're going to call the system and then everything on the outside are the surroundings not part of the system and the study of the relationships between heat work and energy in a system is called thermodynamics and the study of thermodynamics began uh, during the industrialization period in Europe while they were trying to produce heat engines Three terms that we should be familiar with. Open system, and closed system, and isolated system. An open system just means that it exchanges both matter and energy. So matter and energy can be exchanged. This One example of this could be a plant. We know from our studies in the biology unit that both solar energy solar energy can be absorbed by the plant as well as for example CO2 can be absorbed by the plant so both matter and energy can be exchanged with the surroundings a closed system is one that cannot exchange matter but can exchange energy with its surroundings. So an example of this would be a coffee cup. Uh, with a lid. And the idea here would be that since there's a lid on the coffee cup, no matter can get in and out but energy can uh, escape from the hot coffee into the surroundings. Now an isolated system is one that can exchange neither matter nor energy with the environment and this is a pretty difficult thing to actually find in reality. There are no perfect isolated systems and it is just an ideal that we use in our Science, math, physics classes that we take, uh, you know, just as the ideal situation. Often we're talking about, uh, in physics problems, uh, an isolated system is one that no friction uh, is taken or is considered. And so there's going to be no heat loss and you have perfect energy transfers, which we know is not a reality, but it's good for us when we're just trying to model problems mathematically. The first and second law of thermodynamics, we're just going to talk about briefly as, again, these two laws, while very important, to study them closely would take a lot of time. So the first law is the fact that energy can neither be created nor destroyed and it can only change forms. 
Um, there is more to it. It's stating that in a closed system, the internal change in energy, delta H, is equal to the amount of useful energy supplied to the system minus the amount of work done by the system on its surroundings. And we don't have to use this formula um, basically at all. It's just there uh, for this definition. What I want you to think about when we talk about the first law is mainly this one here, the first law, stating that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, only change forms. The second law of thermodynamics uh, is concerned with the direction of natural processes and it states that thermal energy always flows naturally from hot to cold, never the reverse. And if you want that to happen, then you have to do external work on that system. And this explanation or phenomena is often given the term entropy. And it's a pretty complex topic, and we don't have to dive into it too much. I can just give a brief example of entropy. Total entropy can never decrease over time for an isolated system because the entropy of an isolated system evolved towards thermodynamic equi equilibrium, which is like a maximum entropy. So entropy is, they often talk about it as like um, chaos or disorder. And I can give a small example here, for example, uh, and this is a good way to think about it as well, is that all systems will tend towards a lowest possible energy state. For example, like a ball rolling down a hill or this coffee cup em uh, emitting this thermal radiation so that to its surroundings reaching uh, its lowest possible energy state. Uh, or it's thermal equilibrium. So for example, if I had two gases in a container that were separated somehow by a barrier, just somehow they were separated, there doesn't even have to be a barrier there, they were just held um, separated. So this would be considered highly ordered and if this barrier is removed, take this barrier out, and then the particles are free to interchange with each other. This has less order and is more chaotic. And so we always think about uh, systems always have to evolve in this direction. And if you wanted to do the reverse, then external work would have to be done. And so as a summary, when you're thinking about these two laws or you're studying or you're making notes, it's this bullet that I'm mostly concerned with, with the first law. And for the second law, it's this bullet here that all systems tend towards the lowest possible energy state. Or in other words, we always go from hot to cold. And hot, in terms of temperature, is just high average kinetic energy of particles on average uh, to low average kinetic energy of the particles. So the reality in our universe is that the laws of thermodynamics tell us that there's no way to build a perfect machine. And to understand what a perfect machine would be, Think about the basic function of all machines. All machines are designed to convert one form of energy into another form of energy in order to accomplish a specific task. And the energy that performs this task is called the useful energy. And as we go from this paragraph to this paragraph, the fact or the reality is, is in our universe, whenever we have an energy transfer, it's typically never exactly perfect and there's always some waste energy. So during any process some energy is always converted into a form that's not useful. This energy is said to be waste. The incandescent light bulb, this is the old school light bulb before the LEDs, before modern technology. These are the ones that get really really hot if you leave them on. 
These older style light bulbs are a common example of wasted energy. The electric current from the socket in your wall, from your house, passes through a very thin filament in the bulb. Resistance in the wire causes the filament to become very hot. The hot filament glows, producing light. The light itself is the useful energy. And the heat, which isn't useful when you're just trying to light up a room, that heat is considered the wasted energy. And so what we're going to what we're going to do next is we're going to look at a ratio that looks at the useful output energy, which in this case would be the light over the total energy that was put into the system, and then you just have to scale it by 100 to make it a percentage. So efficiency has no units and that's because the units will cancel. And you can find questions for this in the 6.4 section of your workbook. All right, so efficiency is equal to useful over total times 100. And so we can go through some of these questions here to get a feel for this formula. A crane lifting a load of construction materials from the ground to the second floor. The crane does that much joules of work input while doing that many joules of useful work output. What is the percent efficiency of the crane? Now when we talk about efficiencies, there's remember that these there's no um, there's no process that's a hundred percent efficient. So just mathematically, the top number here in this ratio will always have to be a smaller value than this bottom number in this ratio. So the numerator is a smaller number than the denominator, and that's a good way to think about this formula. Because when we look at these two numbers, and you're trying to decide does which number goes on the top and the bottom. We want to put the smaller value on top. So 8.00 times 10 to the 3 joules over 2.30 times 10 to the 4 joules. And then we just have to times that by 100. All right, so I'm just going to expand the scientific notation to show you. It's 8,000 joules over 23,000 joules. You can see here that the joules will cancel. This thousands will cancel. This is basically the ratio 8 out of 23. And after you times it by 100, you'll get that the percent efficiency will be equal to, and you simply got it as 35% efficient, this process. Now, how are they going to vary this equation on us in standard questions in your workbook and on tests and quizzes? Is they'll just give us, um, they'll give us either the percentage or one of these, and then you have to solve for the other. And so, let's take a look at the this one here. So an internal combustion engine with an efficiency of 15% is used to do this much useful work, calculate the input or the total. So the input is the total work. Here we have the useful work and this is the percentage that we are given. So remember that for a ratio of 15%, 15 out of a hundred, that's going to equal some uh, relationship between the useful and the total. So 3.2 times 10 to the 4 joules is useful, then this is our total. And comparing that to the original formula, you can see that this 100 up on the right is just going to be down here on the left as you can see over here. It's a good way to think about it in just terms of uh, percentages and ratios. 
So useful over total is just a ratio equivalent to 15 out of 100 if it's 15% efficient. So solving for total, downstairs right goes upstairs left. Downstairs left goes upstairs right. Upstairs left goes downstairs right. So it looks like uh, 32,000 times 100 divided by 15. And we'll have with, looks like three significant digits, 2.13 times 10 to the 5 joules of total work. Just analyzing our answer, here we have the useful, which is a smaller value than the total. So in terms of a ratio, it does make sense. This one's similar, except now they're giving us the total and they want us to find... Oh, no, never mind. It's the same thing. They're asking for the total. So what is the input? What is the total? So we have 35% uh, efficiency. So 35% means 35 out of 100. And what is the input? So the total is still the unknown, just like the last question. But how do we figure out what the, what the useful energy was? Now, the useful energy is going to be this MGH expression that we discussed at the beginning of this video. So let me just do that off to the side. MGH is equal to 2,000 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second square times 5 meters. So that's our potential energy this is our useful energy. This is our useful work. So 2,000 times 9.81 times 5. That comes out to 98,100. And now we look for our total, cross multiplying and dividing. So basically it's going to be 100 times that divided by 35. So 98,100 times 100 divided by 35. And we have our total energy here of with uh, three significant digits, 2.80 times 10 to the 5 joules. And if you compare that total to the useful, remember the useful is 98,100, so that's going to be 9.81 times 10 to the 4 joules. So comparing the values, it makes sense that the useful is less than the total. And so that's a good way to just to double check your answer, especially after you cross multiply and divide. Did you have uh, the value in the right position in the ratio? And the last one saying a person exerts 150 joules lifting a 10 kilogram box onto a shelf that is 1.4 meters above the ground. So let's just take a look at that potential energy. That's 10 by 9.81 by 1.4. Take a look at that value. And that is 137.34. Four. So this value is smaller than this value here. So when you're thinking about which values are which, the smaller value is the useful energy. So this would be the energy required to lift an object against the force of gravity.
a certain distance or certain height. So this is the useful energy, 137.34 joules. Now the person, maybe they had a uh, a banana before and that banana was converted from ke chemical energy into kinetic energy and maybe 150 joules of energy was expelled or used and so when you look at this ratio the joules will cancel 137.34 divided by 150 is with uh, two significant digits, 0 0.92, and so all you have to do is times by 100 if you'd like the percentage, so 92% efficiency. And I'm not sure if this is accurate or it's just numbers that are useful in this formula. And the last section is, oh, there's two sections left, mechanical energy and work. Okay, mechanical energy is defined as the kinetic energy due to an object's motion added with an object's potential energy due to its vertical position relative to some reference point. So since an object can have both kinetic and potential at the same time, mechanical energy can be calculated using the following formula. All right, so if you're asked to solve for mechanical energy, it's simply just the sum of its potential and kinetic at some moment in time. So calculating total mechanical energy is going to be EK plus EP. So EK is one half mv squared and EP is mgh. So we got one half. The seagull is flying horizontally carrying a clam. And so they want the mechanical energy of the clam when the seagull is 30 meters above the ground. So we'll need the 300 gram clam in kilograms divided by a thousand. And then its speed is 8 meters per second, so don't forget to square that. Plus mgh, we got 0 0.3, 9.81, and the 30 meter height above ground. And so this sum will be the total mechanical energy of the clam. So thinking about this in a sense of energy and the ability to do work, this amount of energy is due to its motion, and this amount of energy is due to its vertical height and so the sum of that is its total mechanical energy the ability to do work or the ability to change the energy of some other object okay so we got 0.5 times 0.3 times 8 squared plus 0.3 times 9.81 times 30 and we have three significant digits so I'm gonna go 97 point nine joules. All right, next one's about a 55 kilogram high jump athlete leaping into the air into in an attempt to clear the bar. At the top of the leap, the athlete has a total mechanical energy of 3,000 joules and is moving at 8.3 meters per second. Calculate the potential energy of the athlete. All right, so EM is equal to EK plus EP. And since we're asked to solve for the gravitational potential energy, you solve for this EP term, which means simply subtracting the EK from both sides. So EM minus EK equals EP. They told us the total mechanical energy was... 3,000 joules, so 3,000 minus, and it's moving at this speed, so we're going to have to calculate its kinetic energy as 1 half, 55, 8.33 squared, so 3,000 minus 0.5 times 55 times 8.33 squared, 
and I'm getting 1,092. We have three sig digs, so we'll go 1.09 times 10 to the 3 joules of potential energy. A construction worker drops a 2 kilogram hammer from a roof. When the hammer is 50 meters above the ground, it has a total mechanical energy. Calculate the kinetic energy of the hammer. So this is the exact same question as above, except instead of subtracting, uh, instead of subtracting the kinetic, we'll subtract the potential. So remember, EM is equal to EK plus EP, and we're now we're trying to calculate the kinetic energy. So we will subtract EP from both sides, and so EM minus EP will equal EK. If the total mechanical energy is 1.88 times 10 to the 3, so that's 1880, minus the potential energy at this point, so it's 50 meters above the ground at 2, with a mass of 2 kilograms, so MGH, 2 is the M, 9.81 is G, and the H is 50. And this will equal EK. So 1880 minus 2 times 9.81 times 50. And 3 sig digs is good, so we got 899 joules of kinetic energy in the falling hammer. If a 20 gram dart is fired from a dart gun with a horizontal speed, the total mechanical energy of the dart is given. Calculate the gravitational potential energy of the dart. Okay, so same idea as before. EM minus EK will equal EP. 0 0.481 joules is the total mechanical energy and they told us that it has a horizontal speed of 4.1 so we're going to go one half now this 20 grams I'm going to convert that into kilograms 20 times 10 to the minus 3 and here we have 4.1 squared and this will equal EP So 0.481 minus 0.5 times 20 times 10 to the minus 3 times 4.1 squared. And we end up with a value of 0. Point, with three significant digits, 3.13 joules. I think as a uh, follow-up question to this, a good question would be is when you know what height is it at and so then you'd further expand EP into MGH and then you would divide out MG on both sides to solve for H so this is a good follow-up question just an add-on so I'll take that 0 0.313 and I'll divide it by its mass so I'll divide by 20 times 10 to the minus 3 as well as 9.81 and so I got an answer of 1.59 meters above some reference point okay last page we made it so here we are talking about work and an object that possesses mechanical energy is able to do work. That is, its mechanical energy enables that object to apply a force to another object in order to cause it to be displaced. So have a look at this uh, construction site image. You can see that we have this big demolition ball and with its, with a large potential energy here, you know, relative to where its point of contact will be, 
you can see that there's some delta H. So there's some gravitational potential energy. Now that potential energy here, it's going to get converted into kinetic energy through the force of gravity. And then some work is done on the building causing these uh, particles in the building to be displaced. So work, as the definition, work may be defined as a change in energy. Work and energy both being scalars, units, or joules. Okay, so this one here, it's on your data sheet. Work equals delta E. And so whenever you come across this delta notation in your science class, it's always going to be final minus initial. And so with energy, it's energy final minus energy initial. So we can often solve for work by looking at the change in energy. So let's see how these three questions come about. So as you pull on a bowstring, the magnitude of the force must increase as you approach the maximum draw. So all that means is that first, when you're first pulling, it's easier. And then as it gets more and more tighter, uh, more tension in, in the bow, in the string, then it just becomes harder and harder to pull. So that's why in this question, the archer pulls back by applying, they give you an average force. So because the force is changing, they'll give you an average force. Here's the distance that they gave us determine the amount of potential energy stored in the bowstring and the bow. So because we're asked to find potential energy, we can actually find we can find that potential energy, which is a change in potential energy due to work being done. We can solve for it by just doing the force times the distance. So 50 newtons multiplied by 0 0.32 meters, remember to convert that to your standard units, 50 times 0.32 is 16 newton meters or 16 joules. And so if you look at this other side of the equation here, this would be EP final minus EP initial. We're actually solving for EP final since EP initial is actually zero because when the bow is not being pulled back, it has zero potential energy initially. And so we are solving for the potential energy final by solving for the work done. So that's what these last three questions involve. So if you're asked to solve for work, you can use energy concepts. And if you're asked to solve for energy, you can use work concepts. So here we have a ball moving at a certain speed hit by a racket. That force accelerates the ball to a new speed in that same direction. Determine the work done by the racket on the ball. So if I want to solve for work, but I was given nothing about force and distance. I actually don't even need it. What I can do is I can solve for its change in energy. And in this case, it would be a change in kinetic energy. So let me just rewrite that. Work will be equal to EK final minus EK initial. So 1 half MV final squared minus 1 half MV initial squared. All right, so we got 1 half. 42.5 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms, because right now it's in grams. And the final velocity is 9 meters per second, so we'll remember to square that. Minus 1 half, the same mass, and the original speed was 3. Don't forget to square it. All right, so I got uh, to two, two significant digits, 1.5 
joules of energy. And the last question determined the work done against gravity lifted a height of 2 meters. We'll have to sneak in here at a constant velocity, and that's important, so that there's no change in kinetic energy as well. So the work is only done against the force of gravity to change the potential energy, not to change the kinetic energy. So determine the work, I can simply look at the change in the potential energy. So I can look at mg delta h, so one kilogram 9.81 meters per second squared times 2 meters. And with two significant digits, this is just going to be 20 joules.